Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob announced today that the government has agreed to allow a special employees provident fund withdrawal of 10,000 ringgit. This was after the PM said that his administration had listened, studied and scrutinised the request from all parties to withdraw the EPF contributions. The government had previously allowed the withdrawal of EPF contributions through three schemes, namely Ailistari, Aisina and Aichitra amounting to 101 billion ringgit, involving 7.3 million contributors since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the country two years ago. He says that based on the findings of comprehensive studies and research in the recovery phase after the pandemic, it was found that there remain those among Kuaga Malaysia who are still affected by the economy, loss of income and are rebuilding their lives. Ismail Sabri admits that this is a difficult decision as it involves people's old age savings and this special withdrawal is a middle ground between addressing today's urgent needs and future savings for EPF's members. During his live broadcast, the PM implored for contributors to make due consideration before making a withdrawal for the sake of their future. Following the Prime Minister's announcement, Finance Minister Tunku Datuk Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz said the details of the withdrawal will be revealed by the EPF in the near future. This was echoed by the EPF in a statement where it said that further details on the application will be announced imminently. The EPF also said that as the country rebuilds, the economy and more people have returned to work, the fund believes that this should be the last facility allowed under the Special Withdrawal Initiative. The fund also reiterated its concerns around members' retirement adequacy and hopes this will be a precursor towards the rebuilding of retirement savings and reforming of the nation's social security system. Earlier in the week, Zafrol had disclosed that the EPF dividend rate should have been higher at 6.7% compared with the 6.1% announced recently if there had been no outflow of savings by its members. He said an additional dividend of 5.4 billion could be distributed to all EPF members. In Parliament on Monday, Zafrol also cautioned that the EPF will have to dispose of more overseas investments as well as halt domestic investments in the short to medium term if another 10,000 ringgit withdrawal is to be allowed, which will have serious implications in the long run. Finance Minister Tunku Datuk Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz said that the government via Digital National Bahad will maintain the single wholesale network model in the country's planned rollout of the 5G network. At the same time, Putrajaya will offer 70% ownership in DNB to mobile network operators in the country under the move which it says will demonstrate the government's firm stance on policy continuity. Zafrul says that by maintaining the SWN model, there will be no additional financial implications in relation to DMB's contract with appointed 5G network hard work provider Ericsson Malaysia. The finance minister was speaking at a joint press conference with communications and multimedia minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa. Anwar said the proposed 70% stake sale in DMB's to MNOs was brought forward from 2024 to encourage public-private partnership for the nation's 5G rollout. Zafrul says the stake sale will have no impact on DMB's existing contract with Ericsson and that that negotiations with the MNOs are expected to be concluded by end June. The decision comes despite an earlier proposal by MNOs to implement a dual wholesale network model. Anwar says that after taking into consideration numerous views from stakeholders such as the MNOs, MPs and the public, the government decided that the SWN model with accelerated equity participation by the MNOs was the best option. Anwar also says that this would not make DNB a monopoly because MNOs will be involved through the stake acquisition. He also reiterates that the SWN model is the best solution to accelerate the implementation of the 5G network with the objective of facilitating 5G usage among the people in the country. In terms of wholesale pricing for the 5G network, Anwar says it will cost less than 20 cent per gigabit, which is lower than the wholesale price for the 4G network. 
EcoWall International saw its losses narrow quarter-on-quarter for the first quarter of FY22 from 56.3 million to 14.7 million, mainly due to lower share of losses in its joint venture. The group also attributed the lower net loss to higher contributions from West Village and Yara One, which were partially offset by lower realised and unrealised gain on foreign exchange and other income. However, on a year-on-year basis, the group sank into the red compared with a net profit of 56 million in the first quarter of FY21, while revenue for the quarter tumbled 84% to 49.2 million from 303.3 million previously. EWI said the group's sales for the first four months of FY22 were 68% higher than the sales recorded in the same period in FY21, along with a strong reservation pipeline of 393 million ringgit. President and CEO Dato Tio Leong Seng said that EWI had a good start to FY22 as the attractive incentive packages led to a resurgence in buying interest in its properties. While he acknowledges the uncertain market environment caused by rising geopolitical tensions, he says that EWI's strategic decision made at the end of 2021 to accelerate the cash recruitment via the sale of its completed units remains sound. Theo adds that the group continues to see good interest from investors, which includes several large offers that it is currently assessing, where if EWI EWI decides to proceed, its plans to repatriate the capital could be accelerated. Aside from its current portfolio, Theo also mentioned EWI's other UK JV, EcoWorld London, had successfully obtained the planning permission for its Woking site located in Surrey, which has an estimated GDV of around £350 million, with eyes on a late 2022 launch. Science Texas net profit for the second quarter of FY22 fell 16% year on year to 93.7 million as higher raw material costs and freight costs ate into margins. Revenue by contrast improved by 5% to 952 million from 906.6 million during the quarter, chiefly thanks to its packaging division, which saw stronger demand for its industrial and consumer packaging products. However, this was tempered by its property segment, where revenue fell by 9.9% due to slowdowns in some of its progress down south. It was a similar story for the first half where a net profit fell 4% to 196.6 million despite revenue growing by 10% to 1.88 billion from last year's 1.71 billion ringgit. In a statement, CEO Lim Peng Jin said the reopening of businesses and improving economic activity here and abroad bode well for the group. He says that Scientex has seen stable demand for its packaging products and will continue to expand capacity in areas of competitive strengths as well as pursue innovation across several categories to further enhance its market position. This includes continued development of a wider range of sustainable packaging solutions to meet increasing demand. As for its property segment, Lim says Scientex is looking forward to meeting the vast requirements for affordable homes on the back of a gradually recovering economy and high vaccination rates of the population. A five-member federal court bench led by Chief Justice Tun Tunku Maimun Tuan Mat has unanimously dismissed Datuk Sri Najib Razak's appeal to adduce more evidence to the SRC International Graph case in a bid to overturn his conviction and sentence. Chief Justice Tunku Maimun said the ex-PM's application to adduce fresh evidence did not comply with the requirements set by the court for it to consider allowing further evidence. The Chief Justice laid out circumstances where further evidence could be adduced, namely that the evidence must not have been made available during the trial proper, that it is relevant and credible, and that it would have raised reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury or trial judge in arriving at the decision of the case. The court found that these requirements had not been met and that the evidence Najib seeks to adduce is not relevant. She adds that what the defence is trying to adduce relates to charges he faces in another trial, namely the ongoing 1MDB Tanora case and not in the present case.